Hello. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, hope you've had a good week. Uh, kind of had a rainy day today, but uh, not too much accumulation, just grass too wet to mow. <laughs> if you have a, a Bible, we are still looking at how to live for Jesus as is shown in the book of John. We're in John chapter 10. Uh, we're, we've gotten down to uh, verse 17 in John 10. Jesus is telling us that he's the good shepherd. There's no one like Jesus to be a shepherd. No one can lead us like he leads us, tend to our needs, feed us. He is the good shepherd. Everyone else, when the wolves come, they run away. But he will give his life for the sheep. And later on, he would do that. So if you have your Bible, we want to join. We're going to start in verse 17. And uh, Jesus is going to step it up a notch on what it means to truly lay down his life for the sheep. And so uh, before we get there, we need to talk to the Father. We've got a lot of things to talk about. world's changing. Uh, first time in 70 years we have a king in England. Um, by Sunday morning, it will be 21 years since the Twin Towers fell and uh, a plane dropped in a field in Pennsylvania and another one uh, tried to uh, attack the Pentagon. But God's still on the throne and we're just fine. So let's pray, all right? Dearest, loving Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, not just for preserving our lives, but for blessing our lives, for letting us see wonderful things in this world and giving us the strength to get through the trials we face. Father, we pray your blessing on each of us who are striving to live for Jesus. Help us live, help us speak, help us love in a way that honors Jesus every day with every person we meet. Father, thank you for blessing us and for leading us to you. Thank you for all those people that you use to do that. Father, glorify your name. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we are in uh, John chapter 10. As I said, we're going to start in verse 17, where Jesus tells us that um, the men who nailed him to the cross didn't kill him. All right, let's read that. We'll start verse 17. It says, uh, for this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, okay, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I thought... The men who nailed him to the cross killed him. You would think that, except for two things. Number one, here Jesus says, no man takes my life from me. So those men didn't take his life from him. Okay, uh, how else do we know that? Well, they nailed him to a cross, which is crucifixion. The slowest, most horrible death that you could imagine on earth. They nailed your hands to a cross. They tied your arms up here. They bent your legs and, and nailed them, your feet together, uh, so that if you wanted to, now you could inhale, but if you wanted to exhale, you had to push up on that bottom, on that bottom nail just to be able to exhale. And eventually you got so tired you couldn't do that. In suffocation and exhaustion, you would finally just fade away. But that's not how Jesus died. Moments before he died, before he bowed his head and gave up the spirit, what did he do? He cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He cried out loud, it is finished. Okay? He cried out in a loud voice. If you're dying by crucifixion, you don't have a loud voice. You just barely got a whisper. No. He laid down his life. It's not like he, his life gradually ebbed away and he was gone. When he thought, I have suffered enough, it's finished. Now, when he said it's finished, by the way, uh, all of these clay tablets we found all around Palestine, uh, 
bills of sale from all kinds of different shops. Bought this many things, sold this many things, and at the bottom of each one of them, it says, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full. But the way they wrote paid in full is the exact same way that Jesus said, it's finished. When he died on the cross, it's paid in full. And when he knew it was paid in full, he said, okay. It didn't say he died and his head fell. It says he bowed his head and then he breathed his last. He bowed his head and then he gave up the ghost. Jesus was in control of the situation. He was sacrificing himself so you could live, so we could live. And we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. But he says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I received this command from my father. I lay it down and I take it up again. What would he do three days later on Sunday morning? Nobody's around. Just by the power of a sinless, indestructible life, he comes forth from the grave. No prophet called him forth. He just came forth because death couldn't hold him because it wasn't his sin. It was our sin. And he took our sin on and he died for our sin. Him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He did it. He did it for us. We say thank you. But he says, no man takes my life. I lay it down on my own accord. What a shepherd. What a shepherd. Let's go on. Verse 20. Verse 19. It says, <clears throat> and there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, well, He's a demon, and he's insane. Why are you listening to him? Others said, these are not the words of someone who's possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Good point. Okay, <laughs> if you can't deal with what someone says, if you can't handle the message, the most common tactic is to attack the messenger. And so they can't deal with what he says. What he says is amazing. <clears throat> He's got a demon. Oh, something's wrong with him. No, the, the words he says are not the words of somebody who's crazy. And they're not the words of someone who's possessed by a demon. And besides, how many demons you know were able to give sight to the blind and heal the sick, do all those things he did? See, the, the signs of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, that's why we believe. Nobody else walked on water. Nobody else came forth from the dead after, by his own power. Nobody else raised the dead, somebody else, after four days. No one gave sight to someone born blind. Nobody, I mean, he is amazing. Nobody took a boy's lunch, fed 5,000 people. Okay, nobody stood on a mountain, glowed like the sun. The signs of Jesus, the miraculous signs of Jesus, are way beyond anything else we know of in all the history of the universe. He's my Lord. There's no one like him. He's my shepherd. There's no one else I want. Okay. Verse 22. So there's a division. Some people hold one, they hold the other. Why? The same, the same signs happen to everybody. How come some believed and some didn't? Same way it is today. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, it's, he says <coughs> that they, it doesn't say they couldn't believe, it says they refused to love the truth so as to be saved. And that's the way people are today. They refuse to love the truth because I don't want to let go of my pet sins. And so because of that, I can't be saved, but I just want to... That's not right. Don't go there. So there was division. So now it lets us know what time it is. Uh, back in chapter 7 and 8, it was the Feast of Booths in autumn of the year after the Day of Atonement. For a week, they would live in these little buildings made out of sticks, and they would wave palm branches in the air and rejoice and all that. That was autumn. Now, it's winter. <coughs> we would call it Hanukkah. They called it the Feast of Dedication. Okay, verse 22. It says, At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon the porch of Solomon. <coughs> so the Jews gathered around him and, and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're this Christ, tell us plainly. 
Okay, it's winter. He's walking along in the temple. Uh, probably got a cloak over him. And uh, because of the colonnade, the, he's got shade instead of sunshine. So any warmth from the sun, he doesn't have that. And it's December. And uh, he says, you know, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And he says, I already told you. Look what he says. Uh, they said, why are you keeping the suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you. And you didn't believe. The worst I do in my Father's name bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you're not part of my flock. He says, believe. I told you that, that I'm the Christ. I didn't say it verbally, but look at my miracles. Look at what I did. Okay? Okay. He hadn't yet raised Lazarus. That's going to happen in the next chapter. But he's done a lot of other pretty impressive miracles. He's already fed 5,000 people the boy's lunch. He's already raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's already raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. He's already given sight to a man born blind. He's healed the lame, cast out demons. There's nobody like this guy. The miracles... I want you to understand the power of the miracles. It's not just that they happened. It's that they happened in an historical context. And Matthew and Mark and Luke and John wrote about them during the lifetime of the witnesses. The miracles should give you more than enough reason to believe in Jesus. Just what he did. It shows he's the son of God. People who don't want to believe don't have a very good case. I mean, he raised the dead. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He stood on a mountain and glowed like the sun. Nobody else had the ability to do that. And it wasn't just the miracles. Look what he said. He said he was the son of God. He didn't say it, but he said it. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Remember that? John eight fifty eight. You know? He said, you're from this world, I'm from another world. You're from beneath, I'm from above. If you believe in me, you'll never see death. Nobody else could say that. But he said it, and he wasn't crazy, because he backed it up with his life and by his resurrection. So he says, if you don't believe me, believe the miracles. I did them. And we need to understand that that record is still there for us. And it's a really good historical record. We have more histo historical documentation for Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead than we do for Hannibal crossing the Alps, for Julius Caesar getting stabbed in the back, for uh, our, our, you know Alexander the Great dying in Babylon in 323, for Cyrus the Great wiping out Babylon. Uh, I mean, there's so many things. Historically, oh yeah, yeah, we believe that. We have way more evidence for Jesus walking on water than we have for any of that. Way more evidence for Jesus giving sight to blind than for any of that. We have 5,000 witnesses of him feeding a multitude with a boy's lunch. And it was written down while almost all those guys were still alive. And not one of them said, oh, no, it didn't happen. Can't find anybody. They know it happened because there's too many people around that if they just said it didn't happen, then they get laughed out of town. They couldn't, they couldn't deny it. They're like the guy, remember in Acts 4, when Peter and, and John are there with the guy that used to be crippled, and he's between them. I think it's kind of funny. He woke up that morning crippled. He spent the night in jail. But, but anyway, he, he's there with them. And uh, they say, uh, they, they, they shoo Peter and John and this other guy out of the room. And then they say, the fact that a notable miracle has been done, we cannot deny because all Jerusalem knows. They couldn't deny it. They wanted to deny it. Couldn't deny it. So Jesus says, my miracles show you that I'm the son of God. Duh. If anybody else does, anybody else do those kind of miracles? Uh-uh. Then he must be the son of God. And he is. And we have reason to believe it. There is abundant evidence from historical and geological and archaeological sources decidedly in favor of the Bible's claim to be the word of God. It's there. Check it out. If you don't check it out, it's your fault. 
Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask, it'll be given unto you. If you're not asking, if you're not seeking, if you're not knocking, you're not finding. Ask, seek, knock. So it says, uh, you know, if you're the Christ tell us, he said, I told you. You just didn't believe me. And your reason you didn't believe me is you're not my sheep. See, if you're one of his sheep, you're going to believe what he says. They didn't want to be his sheep. They didn't want to give authority to him. Because if Jesus, when they came up to Jesus, what did he tell them to do in Mark, Matthew 16, 24? He said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, I don't want to do that. Then you can't follow him. What do you say in Mark 8, 34? Same thing. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. What do you say in Luke 9, 23? Same thing, plus one word. He said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Our job is to follow Christ and to deny self to do it. But they didn't want to do that, so they weren't his sheep. And because they weren't his sheep, they didn't believe. It's not that they couldn't believe, they wouldn't believe. 24 of the 25 most published atheists on earth have one thing in common. They have a degree in theology and they're former ministers. It's not that they couldn't believe. They didn't want to believe. They got mad at God. They pulled a Darwin. Charles Darwin's only college degree is in theology. He's a theologian. He was trained to be a minister. He never got a degree in science. Never. Okay? I probably had more science courses than he had. And I, and I got two degrees in theology. But he's not... He's not in any way qualified to speak on the subject he spoke on. But he did. You know why? Five years before he wrote that book, Origin of the Species, his 10-year-old girl got sick and died. He got mad at God. He doesn't have a scientific reason to believe that. He just wants to try to find a scientific excuse for not believing. Where are you? Check those miracles out. Jesus says, come on, I did them. Nobody else did them. How many people you know walk on water? If the guy you're following can't walk on water, pick somebody else. Okay. So, he says, the reason they don't believe, they're not my sheep. They didn't surrender their lives to me. Surrender your life to somebody who can save your life better than you can. Verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. Short verse, but look at those things. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Okay? They listen to him. He knows them. Do you want God to know you? All of you? Those parts of you that you're not very proud of? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Are you following him? Do you hear his voice? If you're not hearing his voice, you don't know where to follow. Hear his voice. Get your Bible open. Listen to Jesus when he speaks. And when you pray, listen to Jesus when you pray. You don't just pray, you also listen. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. We just follow Jesus. I'm, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm not name brand. I just follow Jesus. I'm just Christian. So, verse 28. He says, Now I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus says, I've got you in my hand. And nobody can snatch you out of my hand. I give him eternal life. You don't earn eternal life. Nobody else can give you eternal life. You can't give yourself eternal life. He gives eternal life. And then he protects you in his hand. And nobody can take you out of his hand. You can't pry his hand open. 
Okay, if I've got a little coin in there, my great grandson, who's a year and a half, tries to pry my fingers open. He can't pry them open. Okay, I'm stronger than he is. Not stronger than very many people, but I'm stronger than an 18 month old boy. All right, but the thought is, he can't do that. You can't pry open God's hand, and neither can anybody else. Nobody can pry open his hand. He says, I have them in my hand, and nobody can take them out of my hand. Nobody can take you away from Jesus. Now, you could be foolish enough to leave, but don't go there. And he's not done. Look at the next verse. <clears throat> he says, no one can take him out of my hand. And then he says, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch him out of my father's hand. So he says, I've got him in my hand, and then my father has him in his hand. Nobody can take him out. Can anybody take you away from God? No. Nobody has the power. No religious system, person, no spiritual power, no angelic, demonic power. Nobody has the power to take you out of God's hand. And, and you're in Jesus' hand and God's hand. And nobody can take you out of that. In fact, you know how you can whip, you can whip Satan? Say, what? No, you don't say, you know, like, Satan, I bind you or anything like that. You don't bind Satan. Jesus bound Satan. Jesus took away from Satan the power he used to have. Oh, death's where you're sting. The way, you know, the power of death is sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 following, okay? That, that was what this, uh, Satan tried to use to, to get people. He lost that power because Jesus took away the power of sin and death, didn't he? And when he did that, Satan lost his power. Hebrews 2 verse 14, it says, We as children partake of flesh and blood, and he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of sin and death, that is the devil. That's numeric standard. But, but the thought is he had the power of sin and death, but he didn't have any more. He didn't have any more because Jesus took it away. And so he says, you're in my hand, you're in the Father's hand, and nobody can take you out. And Satan doesn't have the power he used to have. Jesus took his power away. Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Now, that's a message. But he doesn't stop there. You'd say, Jesus, if you'd just stopped there, maybe they wouldn't have killed you the next week. But he didn't stop there. He gave us verse 30. He said, I and the Father are one. It's true. Back in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word, verse 14, dwelt among us. We become his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was in the beginning with God. And he was God. And he is God. And he, had, he says here, he doesn't say, I was equal with God. He just says, I and the Father are one. They're one. They still are one. I and the Father are one, he says. He's telling the truth. <sighs> what do you think the result is of that? You almost don't want to read verse 31. It says, uh, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Oh, again? Yeah, remember back in chapter 8, verse 58, when he said, before Abraham was, I am? What did they do in verse 59? They picked up stones to cast at him because they thought he was blaspheming. Because if I said, I am the Father one, if I said, before Abraham was, I am, I would be making divine claims that I couldn't back up. But he wasn't. He was making divine claims that he could back up. The, read the claims of Jesus Christ. He didn't think he was just a good teacher. He thought he was the son of God. He thought he was from, we were from this world and he was from another world. He thought we were from below and he was from above. He thought if we would believe in him, we'd never see death. Because that's what he said, John 8, 51, 52. He's going to say it again in chapter 11. He says, I'm the light of the world. He says, I'm the bread of life. 
on the water line. It's like all the stuff Jesus said, nobody can say that stuff and have anybody think that they were sane. Jesus said that stuff. And now some people said, oh, he's crazy. But the other one said, he doesn't talk like a madman. And he, he gives sight to the blind. If somebody's a madman, can they give sight to the blind? Okay, then he, he's not a madman. He's not. Let the miracles affect your life so that you can be one of his sheep and hear his voice and let him change you so that through you, he can continue changing the world. Okay. So, uh, verse 32. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works for my father. Which of them, for which one of them are you going to stone me? Well, the Jews answered him, uh, well, it's not for good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Okay, you said I and the Father are one. That's blasphemy. Not if it's true. He stood on a mountain and glowed like the sun. Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9. Nobody else did that. He walked on water. Yeah, he helped Peter do it for a while, but he sunk and he had to help him back up. Nobody else could do that. He fed multitudes with five loaves and seven loaves of bread and a few fish. That's impossible. He says, I'm good at doing the impossible. He raised people from the dead, the widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, and he's going to raise Lazarus in the next chapter. So he's who he said he was, and what he did proves it. We have reason to believe, and the main reason we have to believe is the miracles really happened. I know there's people that don't want to believe the miracles because they say, if we don't see those miracles today, then they never happened. Uniformitarianism doesn't work. It doesn't explain our known universe. Too much catastrophism had to happen for the earth to get here. Of all the biblical events, one of the most obvious, the most testified to by archaeological evidence, by geologic evidence, is Noah's flood. It really happened. There really was a worldwide flood. If there was, what would you expect to see? Well, billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Guess what we have? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Okay? And we have bent rock layers. You don't bend rock, but you can bend sediment while it's wet. How do you get that much sediment wet at the same time? Noah's flood. Not another way. I mean, there's too much evidence. He really is the Son of God. He really did make the world. There really was a worldwide flood. All those things are all true. But the most amazing of them, and the most documented of them, is Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And he's Lord. He, had the, he laid his life down. He had the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. He just said that, verse 17 and 18. And he did it in chapter 19 and 20. He's the son of God. But they didn't want to believe that. So, oh, you're blasphemy. So they accuse him of blasphemy. And then he says, which of the miracles? Well, no, it's not the miracles because you said you're equal with God. And he says, okay. Jesus answered them, verse 34. Is it not written in your law? I said you're gods. Psalm 82. It says, I said you're gods. Verse 6. So he said, if he said it, and that's in the scripture, and I like the way I like he said it. If he called them gods to whom uh, the word of God came and the scripture can't be broken, do you say of him uh, whom the Father consecrated and sent in the world, you're blaspheming? Because I said I'm son of God? He says, hey, the word of God, he says you're gods. Why can't I say it? <sighs> he had a good point. But they wanted to believe what they wanted to believe, which is sadly the case for a lot of people today. But this is the Lamb of God. This is the shepherd, the good shepherd who came into the world. You want to follow him? Spend some time getting to know him. Listen to his words. He will give you life that you could not imagine receiving. 
because he said, John 10, verse 10, he came that we could have life and have it abundantly. Hope you seek that. Hope you get it. In God, we trust. In God, we, uh, grant, we ask blessings. Take care.